Welcome back. Um, so we're excited to have another, another great talk, uh, starting with Jim. Um, I'll ask my usual question, Jim. Where are you? Okay. What time is it? So I'm in Reading, just outside of London, pretty close to where the Microsoft UK headquarters is. Uh, and it's five past seven in the evening. Five past seven. So we are slowly getting to the time where uh, um, the Europe will be, will be um, Drinking their beers and watching watching FSRFConf, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I've, I've held off on the beers for now. It's just the water at the moment. Oh, wow. Well, so we're, we're, we're disappointed. We're um, disappointed. <laughs> all right. So you have a talk for us about Xamarin and FSRF. Um, yes. And I see you have, you have a, your Xamarin log already in the back, right? Yeah, I've got, uh, got the logo. I've got the monkeys. I'm, we're all about the Xamarin here. Is this, is this your usual setup or is this just a just a fake installation for this talk? No, 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 this is pretty much my usual setup. I always have the monkeys around. I managed to secure the Xamagon during a talk in Vietnam. Microsoft have a whole load of these kicking around, wow. so I just didn't have one. So cool, yeah, this cool is stuff. pretty All much right. my normal. So I'll, I'll let you get started. I'm switching to your screen now and okay. you can kick off. OK, I'll, cool. I'll, yeah. I'll turn off my video. I think you can probably turn off yours as well so that we can see the full screen and I'll sort of ask you to turn it back on at the end for the Q&A. OK, just give me one second to get my... Ah, I've lost my mouse. Ah, well, we can, we can leave it this way as well. It's fine. But you'll probably need to find your mouse anyway, right? I will probably need to find my mouse. Yes, yeah. there's, there's my mouse. There we go. Excellent. Um, no, I think this is, this is good. We um, see your video in the corner. So now it's covering the left bottom corner of your slide with your Twitter. Okay. Um, uh, I can't, there, how's that? Perfect. Yeah, that's great. All right. Sweet. Uh, cool. Get started. Thank you so much. OK, so yeah, so I'm here to talk about building mobile apps uh, with Xamarin and F Sharp. So this is all about getting F Sharp running on iOS and Android. Unfortunately, we're not going to be talking about getting it running on your shoes. So uh, that's not going to happen in this talk. So I'm Jim Bennett. I'm a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. And my area of interest is mobile apps built with Xamarin. I'm a C Sharp developer normally, but I do dabble in F Sharp. So when you see some of my code later, I apologize if it's not particularly great. So I thought I'd start by just talking about what is Xamarin. And really, to set the scene, I have to talk about how we build mobile apps. So when we think about the default way to build mobile apps, the way that Google and Apple want you to do it, it's all very siloed. We often use the term silo approach in the Xamarin community. So for iOS, you're expected to build your mobile apps using, it used to be Objective-C, now they're pushing Swift, and they want you to use Xcode on a Mac. That is the iOS way. The Android way is Java, or more recently Kotlin, a JVM-based language that's come out of JetBrains. And you build that on Android Studio, on Mac, Windows, or Linux. Now, this is great because you get the tool chains from the people who make the operating system. But the problem you have is you end up writing your code twice. So for every app you build, you have to write it once in Swift and then again in Java. That's no shared code, multiple teams building your code. It's not the most efficient way of doing it. Now, the Xamarin way, on the other hand, the traditional Xamarin way, is using what is essentially C-sharp wrappers around those native APIs. So Xamarin provides you with simple .NET wrappers around the iOS and the Android APIs, and then a whole tool chain associated with that. So a typical Xamarin app you would write your code as if it was a native iOS or Android app. But because you're using C Sharp for everything, you can share business logic. So anything that's not UI related, you can share between iOS and Android. And that gives you typically 70% or thereabouts of code shared between the two platforms. And this builds to fully native apps, it's full native API access, it's all great. Now, of course you're thinking, why is he talking C Sharp? This is F Sharp conf. Well, as well as the whole C-sharp toolchain, because these are just .NET wrappers, you can do everything in F-sharp as well. So we have full support, full compiler support, full debugger support for writing apps for iOS and Android in F-sharp. 
The traditional way of doing this is you would use your iOS app would have a whole load of code writing against the native iOS UIs. You would use storyboards, the same as you would do in Xcode. You write your F-sharp logic, and then you share that with Android, where you'd build your standard Android UI using layout XML files, exactly the same as you would with a native Java Android app. But you just have the opportunity to share large amounts of code between the two platforms. That's kind of just the basic overview of Xamarin. I'm not going to go into too much detail because that's kind of a talk in itself. Now, as well as this version of Xamarin, where you build your UIs using the native components, we also have a thing called Xamarin Forms. And Xamarin Forms provides an abstraction on top of the native UIs to allow you to define your UIs in either F Sharp or C Sharp code or using XAML. So if you're a WPF developer or a UWP developer, you're probably fairly au fait with XAML. And we have this way where you can define a UI using shared code. So that way you write your UI once, but it runs on iOS and Android. And then behind the scenes, we map that to a native user interface. So you say, I want to put a button on my page. And on iOS, you get a UI button. On Android, you get an Android widget button. So you get the full native UI. So that's the very quick uh, elevator pitch on Xamarin. And the best thing we can do is just kick off some code. So I'm going to launch Visual Studio for Mac. I'm a Mac person, hence why I'm using Mac. And from here, I can go new project and start building an F Sharp app. Now, the support we have for, um, for F Sharp is it's, it's full support in terms of the, um, the, de the compiler, debugger, the whole API experience. We just a little bit lacking in terms of templates compared to our C-sharp brethren. But you know, I guess that's just a question of numbers. So from here, I can say I want a new multi-platform app, and I can create a blank forms app, and I can choose C-sharp or F-sharp, which is obviously you know, pretty cool. This is not just limited to C-sharp. I choose F-sharp, click Next. I give my app a name. Hello, F-sharp conf. And I spin up this app. Okay, so this is the basic structure of a Xamarin app. I have three projects here. This dot iOS is, a, is my iOS app. So this is the code that gets compiled. It goes through the native compiler tool chain and it spits out a, um, an IPA file that will work on an iOS simulator or an iPhone app. I've also got a dot droid project. This then goes through the Android SDKs and it spits out a jar basically wrapped up into an Android package that contains all the code I need to run my Android app on my device. And then here is a core project. This is a .NET standard library, and this contains all the stuff I need to actually build my app. So this contains my user interface, all my business logic, and all this is shared between the iOS and Android app. Now, this starts with a simple page. This is the I guess the canonical Hello World Xamarin Forms app. And this is a simple page containing, let me just adjust my text so you can see it all on screen, containing a, a label and a preview which will appear when I build. And this is XAML. So if you've never seen XAML before, it's an XML based dialogue for building user interfaces. It's pretty much like any other hierarchical uh, tag-based UI. So if you've done HTML, some of the concepts here are pretty similar. I have a page. Inside my page is a label. It has the text set to Welcome to Xamarin Forms. And it's got layout options to say where I want to put it. Behind this page, I have an F-sharp file. Everything is object-oriented when it comes to user interfaces, unfortunately. There's pretty much not much we can do about that. That's the way that UIs are built. So I have my class with my page that inherits from content page, and that then loads my XAML and then renders that on screen. So I can just launch this in a simulator. And here's my standard iOS simulator. This will compile this code up, pump it through the standard Xcode tool chain, everything you need to build an iOS app, and then put it on this simulator. So while it's doing that, I'll just show that really there's not much else to this. We have a simple app class 
that inherits the basic application and sets a main page. So there's not much here. And when this installs, give us a few seconds to launch. And there we go, a basic Hello World F Sharp app running in an iOS simulator. And obviously I can kick this off to run inside a iPhone, an iPad. I could run the Android project, but that takes a bit longer to build, so to save time I won't. And it'll be exactly the same code, run on both, or running using F Sharp. So if I wanted to take this a little bit further, I wanted to expand it. I could say, well, I'm going to put a stack layout in here just to allow me to put more things on my page. And then underneath my label, I'm going to add a button and set my text to be uh, tap me. And I'll make my font large. Put that there. And we'll just... See, so we've got a nice little previewer here that shows me what I'm building. So let's center everything just because we can. There we go. So in my XAML, I can just add the controls I want. I've got different controls. I've got different layouts. And then behind the scenes, this all gets rendered using the native APIs that are available on both platforms. Now, obviously, just having stuff on screen is great, but I need some kind of logic behind it. And so to do that, I start by naming everything. So I've got some names for my controls. I'm going to call this one my label, and I'm going to call this one my button. And then what I can do is in my code behind here, I can start accessing those. So I can say, right, and I'll just drop a do in here. And then I can get my, my label, Ooh, if I could spell, and then on the base, there's a find by name, and this type in my label, my typing is abysmal today. And that gives me access to the label control. I can then do the same thing with buttons. I could say let my button equals base dot find by name. And again, we look for my button. And these will return the label and the button on screen. Obviously, this Find by name just returns an object. So I can just set my type here and let all the type inference work it out for me. And then on my button, I can wire up events. I can say I've got the clicked event and I can add a new handler to that. And then I can say on here, I can say my label dot text, set that to be hello F sharp conf. Something like this. And then again, if I spin this up, this will build this, deploy it to my iPhone, and I better click my button, and I'll see my label update. At least I would do. Oh! You know when it was working yesterday? Okay, I probably mistyped something. Here, here we go. No. There we go. Helps if I could spell properly and put my equals in the right place. <laughs> So, yeah, in a second, this should spin up on the simulator, and I can then have full access to my controls here. And I've got a clicked event wired up. Now, while this is building, I just want to point out that this is probably not how you would write a standard Xamarin app. This is not the normal way to do things. If you wire things up directly to the events, you end up losing testability. So certainly in the c -sharp world, there's a number of different patterns people use to build F-sharp apps. So in a second, I'll start looking at more right ways of doing things. And then we'll take this a bit further and look at probably a much better way of doing things from a functional programming perspective. But right now, excuse the OO. The problem we have is user interfaces are, you know, very object oriented. So if this is going to spin up, I'm hoping this is going to spin up. And then, yeah, here we go. And bang, I tap it, it works. As I say, we have a full debugger experience when doing this. So although this is a native iOS app running on a simulator, the app is debugged by Xcode using the whole 
iOS tooling, but we can hook into that from inside Visual Studio. So from here inside Visual Studio for Mac, I have a full debugger experience. I can hover over the button, at least I could do for some reason. There we go, here's the label. Here's the details of it. It's got the text being set. So everything's there inside the debugger. So even though this is a native iOS app, I have the full debugging experience. Now I'm using Visual Studio for Mac. I can do the same thing for Visual Studio 2017 on Windows. You still have to have a Mac involved in the tool chain. This is an Apple SDK limitation. There's nothing we at Microsoft can do to get around that. But the Mac you need just has to be accessible to Visual Studio via a network. So from Visual Studio 2017 on Windows, as long as you can connect to a network to build your code using Xcode, you can write iOS apps. And this simulator, this is an Apple simulator. It runs on the Mac, but we have capabilities inside Visual Studio on Windows to share this simulator screen back to Windows. So literally, you can connect VS 2017 to a Mac running up in the cloud, build your apps on that, run this simulator on that, and then share that back to your Windows session. So that's pretty cool. It's just sometimes that that can be a little bit problematic over a network when I'm trying to Skype. It seems that demos like that often hate me. Uh, you, works perfectly except when I'm over Skype. So that's why I'm doing everything on Windows. So this is a very simple F Sharp mobile app. And as I say, this is probably isn't how you would wire this app up in a traditional Xamarin type application. Normally you'd use a design pattern such as MVVM. Now, if you've ever done any WPF programming or UWP programming, you may have heard of MVVM. It's model, view, view model. The idea of this is you have your view, which is your UI, and that should be as thin as possible. So your XAML would be your view. You would have your model layer, which is can be models, data objects, services, repositories, anything you need to make your app work. And then you have view models, which act as essentially a value conversion layer. So they exist between your views and your view models and convert the data from your model layer into something the view can represent. So it does type conversion and munges values together. For example, taking a first name and a last name and putting them together into one full name. It handles behavior of the UI and then it handles taking data from the UI and then pushing that down into your model layer. And the reason this pattern is so popular with WPF, UWP, and with Xamarin Forms is this concept of data binding. So when you have anything in your XAML here, what you can do is you can bind properties. So I can say this text should be bound to something called text. And what this will do is this UI will look at some kind of binding context, essentially an object it's been given that contains the state and behavior for this view, it'll, in a very loosely coupled way, search for a property called text on that object, and then keep this label in sync with that text. So if the text in the data context changes, the label updates. If I had this as a text entry control, when I type into the entry control, the object would update. When the object updates, the text entry control updates. Same with behavior. So a button has a command property, which we combined, and this command is an instance of a system windows input i command, essentially an interface that implements the command pattern. So this wraps up some behavior that you can execute. So I'm gonna call this one tap command. I'm gonna lose my names because I don't need names anymore. So what I'm saying here is wire this text up to a property called text on whatever data is associated with this page and wire up the command for my button to an, inter uh, an instance of I command called tap command on whatever data is wired up to this page. And so in my code here, I've got a thing called my view model. This has a text property and a tap command. So I can use this as essentially the data for my page. So I can go base dot binding context, and I can set that to a new my view model. So this will construct this view model and set this as the data for my page. And so when I run this, it'll create this UI, hook up the label to the text, listen for changes on the, on the data object, and update the text if that changes, and then wire up the command again. Now, 
The way that the listening to changes works is via I notify property changed. This is an interface that's been inside the .NET framework since version two of, of everything. So it's been there for a while. If you've done WPF, you know this one really well. This is an interface with one event that is called property changed. And when you publish this, you give it the name of the property that's changed. And so by raising this event, it tells the whole binding system to update this label. So I have my property here, this dot text. This gets from a mutable value here, and this then updates the mutable value and then triggers an event, a property changed event when that value changes. And then I've got my tap command here, which is an, an, an instance of I command, and the execute method is set to set the text to be hello F sharp conf. So when I click my button, my text gets updated. That should then update my UI. So if I just run this, we can kind of see it in action. I'll stick some breakpoints on here so we see what's going on. Now, again, this isn't really the most functional programming way of doing things, but this is kind of canonical Xamarin. This is one of the many ways you can build a Xamarin app, and it's MVVM is probably one of the most popular. Whether it's best or not is very much open for debate, but it's certainly one of the most popular ways of building these kind of mobile apps. So I come in here. So it creates my view model, sets to my binding context. You, you see I'm no longer connecting to the buttons or labels directly. I run this, I hit tap me. It updates the value of my text, triggers the property changed event, and bang, there's my UI updated. So this is how you build a UI using MVVM. It's very loosely coupled. The view doesn't know anything about the view model, except that it has this binding context, which is an object set to something, and then all the wiring is done via name. So it's all very loosely coupled. And so this is a standard way of doing things, and this is still very, very object-oriented, which is obviously not the best when you're in the F-sharp world. But one thing that's great about F-sharp is it, it is a good language for doing OO code. I'm sure there's people shaking their heads when I say this, but it is because you can build things that are fully compatible with the .NET framework. You can essentially take an existing C# -sharp app and almost like rewrite it in F#. -sharp. It may not be the best way of using the language, but it's a way to get started. So with something like Xamarin, which is very OO based, you can build it using objects, and it'll just work. But you kind of have to be OO because UIs are objects. When you think about buttons and labels, they are objects. The polymorphism kind of works really well here. You know, your dog and cat are both type of type animal. A label and a button are both of type view. They have visibility. They have size. When you lay them out, you can request a measurement from them. And the measurement doesn't care what type it is. It just needs to know how big it is. It can request it's drawn on screen. Yeah, another canonical example of OO would be shape, where you have circle and rectangle with draw methods. That kind of works here with these controls. So you can start with objects that UI layer, objects that the view model layer, and then instead of objects all the way down, you can then build your services and repositories and all your other business logic using functions. So it's kind of a way to bring the two worlds together. Obviously, this is not perfect. You know, we've got plenty of mutable stuff here. Now, there hasn't really been in the past a better way to do this that's a well-defined architecture. Lots of people have tried different things and built some great some great apps, some great ways of doing it, but there hasn't been a, a fixed architecture. What we have said here is a great way of doing this. Well, at least not until now. So one thing that's quite cool about Xamarin is our F-sharp support has been great but we haven't necessarily had some of the best people in the world at F-sharp working with us. And luckily we do now. Some guy called Don has been seconded onto our team for a couple of years. Uh, I think he's kind of big in this world. Um, and so he's helping out. One of the things he's helping out with is helping us to define a really good architecture for building mobile apps. And so what he's been working on is Elmish for Xamarin Forms. Now this was mentioned very briefly uh, in the last talk about Fable, the idea of this Elmish architecture, where you have 
a function that creates the view. You have a function that handles messages to update the view. You have model, which is your state, and that's totally immutable. And every time a message is processed that updates that state, the old state is thrown away, new state is created, and that's used to rebuild the UI. We now have, at least in an initial version, support for doing this inside Xamarin Forms. So we can start building our Forms apps without so much the OO, but with a lot more of the sort of functional programming way of doing things. And so I was playing this with this this week, and I built a version of Tic-Tac-Toe. I thought this would be a nice, fun way of doing it. So again, this is a Xamarin Forms app. I have my iOS app, my Android app, and I have my Tic-Tac-Toe core project. I have a XAML page to define my UI because I'm still in XAML, I know XAML, I like XAML, and there's lots of great examples on building cool things with XAML. And in here, I have my tic-tac-toe board. So I've got a nice th uh, three by three grid. I've got a button at the bottom to restart the game. I have a label to show whose turn it is. And I'm doing everything with data binding, the same as I did with the view model. But when I actually look at the code behind it, behind my view itself, I don't have any code except for a little bit of mathematical code to make sure my, my board stays square. Obviously, phones are rectangular shapes. So this is a bit of logic to keep it square. The bulk of my logic is inside my application. Now, when I create this application, I kick off this program, which is part of the elmish.xamarin.forms library. I give it a function to initialize my model. I give it a function to handle messages. And I give it a function to create the view. And then I spit this out into my page. Now, if we actually look at what we've got, scroll up the top, I have this model which contains which player is up next, noughts or crosses, and contains a game board. And this game board is nine cells. And these cells can either be empty or full of a player, and that player is noughts or crosses. So this is kind of nice, simple data modeling, the kind of stuff that F-sharp is ridiculously powerful for doing, the kind of stuff you can write on a couple of lines of code, and it's great, and it's simple, and it's type safe. Now, this model, as you can see, is totally immutable. I don't have the mutable keyword anywhere. In my initialize method, I spin up a new one, set crosses to go first. I always found it bizarre that in noughts and crosses, it's not noughts that goes first, it's always crosses, but that's the rules. Spin up a new board with a whole load of empty cells, and then the bulk of it is inside my update method. So in here, messages come in, and then these messages tell the model, well, they, they basically recreate the model with some form of update, depending on the message that comes through. And then when my view is built, I have various properties bound to things. So rather than have these as properties on a view model, if I just flip back to, to this one here, we had members on the view model, Instead of having those, instead we have some strings and these are bound to either functions that return something or messages. So in the case of, t of the turn message, this is bound to a function called get message. And that get message function will build a message to say whose turn it is or if crosses of one or noughts of one or if the game is a draw based off analysis of the game board. We also have whether we can play a certain cell. So everything here is buttons. When you click a button, it plays the cell, the button is hidden and an image is shown. So again, we have, can I play this, this particular cell? That's bound to a function that looks up for the particular model that we've got. Is the top left cell playable? So is it empty? And if it is empty, are there still valid moves that can be made on the board? So all, all this is bound to functions. There's no state here really that manages that except for my mutable model. And then my play, uh, my play bindings here are bound to a message. So when I click a button here, the command is bound to play bottom left, bottom center, bottom right. That then fires off a message. And these messages get handled by the update function to create a brand new model, return that new model. And so after the update, the new model gets pumped back through here and then if any of these bindings have changed, the UI gets updated. So I'm as stateless as I can be. The only state I have is a single immutable instance of the model that gets replaced with every single message. I could then persist this down to something like a SQLite database so that when my app dies, 
when uh, yeah, say the user wants to go and use a different app, they can then come back to my tic-tac-toe app. They can launch it. It can reload the state from the SQLite database, and I can carry on playing from where I was before. Uh, I'm handling these messages based off tapping buttons, but I could e just as easily do this using timers, using network callbacks, using events from the operating system, kind of anything I want that I want to handle a message for. And then the whole thing is handled message after message after message so that I don't have to worry about any kind of threading issues. So let's just kick this off and show it in action. It's probably a good, a good thing to do. So give this a second to build. This, right. So this is going to create my application using my initial state, which is my empty tic-tac-toe board. Here we go. I click on a cell. We'll see if I look at the old model, you can see that next up was X and my board was completely empty. I processed the message, which was play top left even be a new model. This new model next up is crosses with my top left is full of, of the crosses player. Sorry, and next up is, is naught. So that gives me my new model. I then quickly check my game result to see whether I should put a dialogue up on screen to say whether I won or not. Return the new model. That new model will then cause all these bindings to update. So for example, if I just take a breakpoint, uh, can I stick a breakpoint here? Let's take a breakpoint here. Run this. And then I can then match on here. And we can see that the binding for the message has now changed because next up is, uh, is not. And there we go. Not's turn. So I can carry on playing. And you see everything's being updated. And I win. Yay. And I can OK this. And then when I restart the game, it just initializes my model back to where it was before. So this is kind of a much more F sharp way of doing things. It's based off Elmich, which is based off Elm. Uh, it's really nice, clean way of doing things, but it's still idiomatic Xamarin Forms in some ways. Xamarin Forms is very heavy on the data binding. It's how we do a lot of things. So I still have my data binding. I'm still binding the commands for buttons, the image that we're showing on a on the particular cell to see whether it's a naught or a cross has been played. All that is binding. My XAML, I could just copy and paste things from Stack Overflow to build my XAML. That's great. But inside my app logic, I have a nice, clear, simple set of functions with a mutable state that just gets replaced every time a message is handled. So this is something that's being worked on. It's good enough now to get going. I mean, this app works beautifully. We're doing a lot of work to take this further. I say we, mainly Don is doing most of the work to take this a lot further, to do things like make, having completely constructing the UI using deltas every time so that we can even move away from binding if you wanted to. If you wanted to be kind of full Elmish, you could. But certainly this is perfect to get started if you wanted to do functional programming with Xamarin Forms and kind of stay away from the OO world of UIs. So really quite pleased with uh, with this particular framework. It works so well. So I just want to round off a little bit as uh, I've been going for about 35 minutes. I just want to round off by saying that the F-sharp support we have is really, really good. We are working to improve it, but what we have at the moment is good enough for production apps. So you can build production quality apps in F-sharp, ship them to the stores. Now we have really good F-sharp support. This is not an afterthought. It's merely something that we're now growing a lot more, so we're seeing a lot more interest in it. So just two examples is continuous. So for those who know Frank Kruger, he's obviously well known in the F-sharp community. He built an IDE that runs on your iPad to code up C-sharp, F-sharp. You can build Xamarin apps on there. Uh, and he built this entire IDE in F-sharp. So certainly it is capable of building production quality apps. In fact, the company used to work for in New Zealand, a company called Erode. We built part of this app in F Sharp. So the kind of architecture we chose was rather than build the whole app in F Sharp, because there were certainly if they, just over a year ago, there's a couple of problems around building a Xamarin Forms app with F Sharp. What we did was we built the app in C Sharp, and then we built the service layer. We built the layer that spoke over our REST APIs. We built all that in F Sharp. So that way we could 
write code really quickly, get lots of great type safety, really nice code, get it working. And then over time, they're slowly working to port the app from C Sharp to F Sharp. And the fact that we could use F Sharp to build some of the OO type code that works with the UI made it really easy to do it. So if you want to get started building Xamarin apps with F Sharp, well, if you're using Visual Studio for Mac, you've got everything you need. Everything you need to build mobile apps, F Sharp support is there, it's installed. If you're using Visual Studio 2017, then just relaunch the installer and tick the Xamarin workload and that will install everything for you. So that's all the stuff you need from Xamarin, it's Android SDKs, all the iOS SDKs, we've got smarts in there so that if you connect from Visual Studio 2017 to a Mac, we will set the Mac up for you, we'll install Xcode, we'll install all the tools that you need on the Mac and do all the management for you. So it's really, really easy to get started. In terms of learning more, aka.ms slash zamfsharp is the place to go. This is all our Xamarin documentation for F-sharp. So it's got everything from getting started guides, API guides, a whole load of example code in there. So that's a really good place to get started. Uh, my tic-tac-toe example is up on GitHub. The Elmish Xamarin Forms repository is up on GitHub. So again, you, you can see the code there. I'm still very new to F-sharp, so I'm playing a lot, but I'm always happy to answer questions and show where I am. And I'm available all over the internet at Jim Bob Bennett, or my blog is jimbobbennett.io. Um, so that's kind of everything I wanted to cover today. Awesome, awesome, Jim. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, now, could you please turn on your video? Oh, thank you. Now we can see you. And there are some questions from yes. uh, people who listen to your talk. So first question is from uh, uh, Andre. Uh, in your experience, what architecture patterns lend themselves well to using F Sharp in Xamarin? Um, well, the, pro the problem is a lot of the patterns around are based off very much an object-oriented world. So if you use things like MVVM, which I personally love as a pattern, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of it. I know some people find it too heavyweight. I love it as a pattern and it does work with F Sharp but it is very object oriented. So it's not your sort of canonical F sharp type pattern, uh, but you can build it. You can build apps using this way of doing things though. Really the general rule of these patterns is try and don't mutate your state. So a lot of people will build apps where they will have their state as one particular blob and they will persist that to a SQLite -like database. And then every time the state's updated, they just, create a copy of that state with the updates in it, repersist that down to the SQLite database. So that's their one particular place. And then use something, some kind of messaging to keep those updates sequential. And then things like a mailbox processor to tell the UI to update itself every time. Uh, one way that MVVM doesn't work so well is the fact there's lots and lots of ways to tell the UI to update. So if you've got stacks and stacks of properties all being updated, you can end up raising 20, 30, 50, 100 property change notifications that cause the UI to update. And if you've got things happening on different threads, your view models and your underlying models can kind of get a bit out of whack. So a clean way of doing that is to try and route all your changes through one place and then just use something like say mailbox processor or some kind of similar synchronous way to tell the UI just once to update itself. But I'm really excited about what's happening with the Elmish Xamarin Forms. Certainly if I was building a project going forward, I would probably focus on the Elmish Xamarin Forms and oh. use that as a, as a way to get started. Mm -hmm. And we also have another question related to Elmish. Somebody yeah. is asking if there is an ETA for Xamarin that Elmish release version and any coding uh, sample project we can use. Um, I don't know on the ETA. Uh, that's a question for Don, I guess. I honestly don't know. I will try and find out and make the information available. There is a couple of samples in the repo. Uh, let me just, can you go back to showing my screen a second? Sure. Let's do that. That'd be cool. Done. Cool. So if you see here, under the FS Projects Elmish.Xamarin Forms repo, there's three samples. So there's a simple counter, so for just counting up something. Uh, there's a master detail one, which gives 
some of the examples around navigation, you know, a multiple page app. So you can see how we can have this essential, this kind of Elmish loop running on each page and then navigate from one to the other. And there's this tic-tac-toe sample, which is the one that uh, I was just showing off. Awesome. And we're going to be working on a number of versions of this to show the very simple case that I've used where we use Xamarin Forms and XAML and binding for everything. And then I know Don's working on a more advanced one where we have some things a little bit slower sometimes, but we try and rebuild the whole UI each time to try and get away from sort of stateless UI. And if that at the moment is a little bit flickery because it's doing a lot of rebuilding, but we're working on, I say we, Don is working on optimizing that quite a lot so that it just updates the things for you rather than rebuilding the UI. So this is the place to come to look for it. And this will just keep growing and growing and growing as we build more samples. But as for release date, I don't know. The new get package is, it, yep, so it's available as a pre-release on nuget.org right now. Yeah. So cool. you can just do install package .xamarin forms. Yeah, there are a few more questions, but I think we can answer them afterwards. And right now, okay. let's welcome Evelina with uh, the next talk about how to look like a statistician. Mm -hmm.